Hi, book club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 93, and our book is Wrath of the Lost, which I don't have a physical copy of, by Chris Forrester. The book tells the story of Primaris flesh terrors going back to Cretacea to retake their planet. We posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our discussions via Twitter, YouTube, our site, or Encrypted Vox channel. Spoiler warning, if you haven't yet read this book, definitely check it out before listening to this episode, as we're going to be discussing the book from start to finish in great detail. With that, let us cheers our very red wines and it's, dive on in. It's not wine, it's vitae. Get the hell out. Stop the recording. <laughs> As always, did you like this book? No. <laughs> No. No. Uh yeah, same. Um, I did not enjoy this book at all. Um, um so I have met world eaters that were more cohesive and more reasonable than these people. Well, I was gonna say that I've met world eaters that aren't ready to kill one another as quickly as these people. I <sighs> I have so much to say. Um, they snarl all the time. Anyways. Um, <clears throat> what parts stood out to you? Let's start on a positive note. What parts um, stood out to you? When the shipmistress Etienne kind of told them off. I She was one of the only characters in the book that I really enjoyed from start to finish. She was like the only one I liked. Okay, no, there's two people I liked. Her and Darren. Same. Yep, same, I same. I was sad when he was killed. I was like, man, the one decent flesh terror on this whole damn planet. Yes. Um, I did like that one. I liked... This is so hard for me to say because I, I very quickly disliked this particular thing. But there is a part, it's on page 97, it's very early in the book, where Dumas is talking about the Black Rage, and he basically has this very religious reverence for it. And he said that these were the angels' final hours given voice by his sons in something that brought the flesh terrors closer to their father than any artifact they had in their possession. This was all they knew him by. And I did... I found that very interesting, and part of me wonders if part of that reverence comes from the fact that he was an unnumbered son. So he did get to see, to be with Gulliman. And it makes me feel a little bad for the Blood Angels because, like, the Imperial Fists, like, Dorne could be out there somewhere, right? The Raven Guard. Korax is out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Same with the White Scars. Same with the Space Wolves. And the Space Wolves even more so because like they know Lehman Russ is coming back. He done told us. He's coming back. Um, even the Dark Angels to an extent, right? Like there's a possibility. Not so much with Sanguinius. Like your Primarch is gone. Well, and with while... The iron, with the Iron Hands. Right? And like whilst... Gulliman can give these like great speeches about like oh man like Sanguinius was so awesome and he was such a cool dude and Dante reminds me so much of him and blah 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 Sanguinius as far as we know or and can assume he's never gonna pop out of some warp rift or he's not they don't have like a casket where all of a sudden you know somebody's gonna show up and be like we can heal him <laughs> Like that's in that kind of that made me sad that so much I, I think so much, especially with Gulliman walking around the planet. I wonder how many how many successor chapters are like, well, when's our dad coming home? Well, a lot of them have touched on that, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, the Imperial Fists definitely have, but some of them just like, you know, he's not our he's not our Primarch. Well, that's true, and that sucks for you. But he's here. And he's the Lord Regent, and this is this is what 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 she got, um, right? But yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, Sanguinius is not coming back. 
He's not. And I wonder, I wonder if had they not served along, especially Dema, I wonder had he not served alongside Gulliman and the Unnumbered Sons, if he would still have that same, like, this is the way we know our father. Or if it's, if it's something, maybe that is, maybe that's just a core person of part of his belief system. But I, I want to believe that it's a little bit more so because yeah, like, again, I do, it, it does, it always makes me feel a little bad because like the, the uh, ultramarines are just like, dad's home. <laughs> <And everyone else laughs> like, My dad's not home. Well, Soon. unfortunately for everybody else, like he was always home. He was in a stasis field. You know, so they could all go, you could all go see him at any time. Right. They did. They would go and pray in front of him. Which oh, yeah. Awkward thinking about it now. But, like, the Imperialists don't have Dorn and Stasis. No. No, he's just kind of out there, they hope. Like, right. and that's the other thing, too. After 10,000 years, who friggin' knows? Like, Jagatai Khan, where is he? Well, he disappeared in the webway to hunt a bunch of Eldar. Mean, Webway is a dangerous place. Seems seems legit, right? Like, there's so many things that just make me a little, yeah. Again, it, 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 that part I actually found that very interesting. Um, Think about Dorn other... though; is I could totally see just from what I'm learning about him, with his father dead, he being like, "There's just not a world worth living anymore." <laughs> and just goes, <laughs> nah. Uh, nah. I don't know. I really. Yeah. Nah. I don't know. I, most of the things I liked was from people delivering really well-timed insults uh, to character. Sure. I, I gotta be honest. At about the halfway point, I started speed reading this thing because I couldn't take it anymore. You know what? I'm almost there with you. I basically got to about page 178. You didn't. Or 100... You couldn't, though, because you were a sucker and were reading it out loud. Well, let me say that. So when I read books aloud, like, I try to read them. I try to go at a very, like, I want to go at a very mellow pace because I want every word to sink in. And I try to do, like, different voices for the characters and stuff like that, right? Um, I got to about a page 178, I want to say it was, because I all of a sudden, like, I went back and I did the math and I was like, we're almost to the halfway point and nothing has happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So then at that point, like, I was reading, like, rumors of names stricken from the rolls of honor and the honors of battle and hidden circles among the seniors of the order. Like, I mean, I was like, I'm, I'm reading instructions at this point. And then, like, everybody had the same voice. I was just like, there will be no cost to our brothers or you, Damas. Build the world without thinking. And even my husband was like, can you read faster? <laughs> I was like, I can't. I can't read any faster. Like, it was, um, yeah, it, it, nothing. Being, like for a book that had a lot going on, nothing really happened. Um, my husband's did it have a lot um, going on? It, it seemed to have a lot going on, right? Like, oh, oh we're gonna me. go and fight the teen Steelers, which I've got a whole bunch of stuff to say about that when we get into the part about it being broken in four parts. My husband surmised, and I th think he's probably true. I think he's probably right. Um, this feels like it was a short story that got stretched into a book. Maybe. So let's let's dive into the meat of this, shall we? Need a lot of booze to handle this. The meat. Um, yeah. <laughs> I didn't say the vitae. I said the meat. Um, <laughs> like they care. Fair. It's technically when you it's all vitae. Um, did you like any of the main characters? No. So like Dama and Barak. No. Let me finish the question, woman. No. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm there with you too. Like I actually started off the book. I hated Dama basically from the beginning. I was not a Dama fan, um, but I really liked Barakiel. Yeah, I did at first, and then there was a point in the book where, and I want to say it was about at part three when part three starts. Um, all of a sudden, he goes from being this very reasonable, very optimistic dude to I am obsessed with finding a cure for the black rage and I'm going to at all costs. That felt like, so this, out of left field. It came out honest. so out of left field. Like I was actually really confused. Like I felt like this book maybe kind of lost its way. I think that's part of my problem with this 
Is yes. that yes, we're supposed to go and reclaim Cretacea, get our relics back. Okay, that was damn funny. That Duma was like, I'm not going back. This is stupid. This is a waste of time, waste of this. Well, but we gotta get the relics. Did you say relics? I mean, you didn't say there was relics. I'm not gonna go now now that I know that there's relics. And then when this whole black You're rage business money. came, I was like, where did this come from? Why is this suddenly so important? And why are we, do we have these two guys who are obsessed with it? These two guys who bonded and the unnumbered sons. And it's thanks to Baratiel, or Baratiel that Duma became a chaplain in the first place. Like they were good friends. And now they suddenly like can't stand one another and they're constantly competing. And they're just so angry all the time. I had a huge disconnect. I did as well. All it. it almost felt as though a lot of time had passed between part two. Basically, after they take care of the gene stealers, it feels like years passed. Like, these are almost different characters. I totally agree with you on that. Because maybe first off, was from passing dick measuring between those two, I was <sighs> like, I mean, maybe my big thing that with that is... Go ahead. No, as I say, maybe, maybe it's from passing through, you know, the the rift is what caused all this hatred and everything. But then when they got to the other side, there were still dicks. So I can't even really say that it was totally that. No, I I can't say it was that. And I, so the Dema thing, Dema's characterization felt very static. I felt he oh, starts okay. off that oh. The death company is important. And he just continues throughout that. Barakiel has like a major character switch. And I agree with you. Like they seemed like they were simpatico. And then all of a sudden, they're not. And they're like at each other's throats. Lots of dick measuring. Again, I have met world eaters that were more reasonable than these two. Just constantly battling at each other. And by the end of the book... If they would have mentioned, if Baracchio would have mentioned finding salvation no matter the cost, I was about to scream. Years and years and years and years ago, a really good friend and I read this one bad romance novel in which the main character, it was one of those forced marriage things, and the main male character mentioned being railroaded into marriage like 50 times. My friend actually went and count. I, I want to say it was 50, 60 times. Um... And so it's become like a returning, a recurring gag for my friend and me. We'll sit there and we'll be like, oh, were they railroaded into marriage? And this whole book, I was like, yep, he's been railroaded into marriage. Railroaded into marriage. Like it just, the way that they kept repeating the same phrase about the salvation of the chapter. And from where did that come? Like hey, out of left field. Did you know that she killed her husband? Oh my God. Exactly. Exactly that. But even that gets dropped like halfway through that book. This like did a reversal where all of a sudden they're just like, oh yes, he just wants to cure the Black Rage. Which, by the way, this goes into another reason why I did not like this character. Call couldn't cure the Black Rage. And Call had 10,000 years. How this reasonable seemingly cool dude who actually like at the beginning of the book i was like so and here's the maybe other thing got misplaced as an unnumbered son like maybe they maybe the sorting hat chose wrong <laughs> for you and you know and right like other thing is it's like i feel like i felt like he was assuming that no one had ever tried in ten thousand years well no and that's the part tried. no one's ever tried like the hubris Sheer bloody hubris. Emphasis on bloody. And so but, so as he asked Darren about it, and he was like, there are secrets that don't, don't need to be found. You know what, Darren? All you had to do was say, yeah, we tried before. It was not good. The end. Instead of being like, there are secrets you don't need. What was Baratiel expecting to find? The secret to curing the Black Rage? So that it's been sitting on Cretacea and they were just like, <laughs> we don't want that though. Yeah. It didn't make any sense to me. It's like the Chewbacca the defense. This did not make sense. 
Well, and here's the other thing about it that it, it kind of bummed me out is like he gets down into the crypt and he sees all of these horribly mutated bodies, right? Where like everything's all like when they were describing the knuckle yeah. bones like being really huge, I was like, oh, so sad. But here's the problem with that. We've already seen that. We saw that in the Emperor's Spears. Because if you recall, they mm. talked about when they were first trying to implant the Primaris, there were mistakes, <laughs> let's say. And they had to put people down. And we had that one character who was horribly maimed and mutated because it just didn't quite work out. So I was like, I feel like this would have some more oomph if you would publish this book 10 years ago before we had already seen this trotted out with the Emperor's Spears. Like, it's or, a, and look, I've read the William King Space Wolves books, okay? One of the things they talk about is how many aspirants they lose basically to just Darwinism. Yeah. Like, people cleaning their, their bolt gun and it goes off in their face. Like, the Space Marines are wasteful, okay? They are horribly wasteful people. These you guys, cannot especially. Get, you cannot talk to me about wasteful with these guys. Oh my god. You guys know that you are low on your blood stocks. You're not even Euro trash space vampires. And here's the part that kind of kills me is that so a very underrated gem from the 1980s, which if you have not seen it, I highly recommend. It's actually from Catherine Bigelow. It is called Near Dark. It has like half the cast of aliens in it. Highly underrated vampire movie. And she basically, rather than going the Euro trash vampire route, she goes the sociopathic, gritty kind of what you would expect actual vampires to be like no real consideration for human life mm -hmm. like that's kind of what these guys were like y'all know you're short on cattle okay not only do you make a little jaunt to kill some gene stealers which i just did not care about um that was so then weird. you guys sit there it, i can't I fuck, like i didn't I, even mm, understand that whole oh. part it's like wait why'd we do this <laughs> We'll get there in a second, um, because there's a whole lot to be saying about that. Um, but then you guys sit there and you spar in the pits and like you sit there and you fight and you get to each other to your bloody, which then makes you need, wait for it, more blood, but you're already low on it. And then you're yeah. like, why are the people, why are our thralls turning against us? Yeah. How dare they rebel? I don't know. Out -told. Okay. I you, don't know. All right. So there's my other favorite character. Was the guy leading the rebellion and said, we are not cattle. There's my other favorite character. <laughs> you said that. And then I get to him and I'm like, dude, he's got like two pages. He has like no screen time. But then you're absolutely right where he's basically like, look, we're not your food source. And again, it's really hard to watch people who are like, okay, we want to. Because on one hand, that's the other part where I really started to hate Baracchio because he's like, okay. We need to be, like, we need to be very cautious. We're going to have to ration, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. But then, like, these guys are sparring in the pits. Him included. So, okay. Not only that. You know you're starving. And you're running a marathon. But cool. they're basically almost, they, and they talk about the number of them that have been killed in the pits. Like, what are you guys doing? Like, even the world eaters know you go to first draw. And then we're done. And they even talked about how that they only let people fight five times in the pits. Fifth time, they were done. That was the rule. So again, when we're saying that world eaters are more rational than these people, that's a problem. That's I didn't like the flesh tears to begin with, and this book made me hate them. Absolutely hate them. This book made me hate them and Demal was probably the greatest offender um here's the other thing about him that i was like what is going on here was like when they're coming back to the chapter they get back to cretacea and he's basically like i don't care what seth says let's just blow it up and he hates like they have that guide who's guiding them right and he's just like oh they're so disgusting and their guttural oh language just... they're so disgusting and i'm so repulsed that this is from whom we draw all of our people and bleh. where did you learn this mentality i want to be okay. i just all right please I... explain it to me did you learn from gulliman as part of the unnumbered sons is that is that where you learned this from all right so pressing extra I dirt i think so ah huh? and the reason why i say this is because remember and Knights of McCrag. 
Remember the Primaris, how he felt about humans? How he's such an asshole? It's like they're beneath us? Yes. But that character was presented intentionally to show you that there is this repugnant kind of undercurrent. Like he was presented to be unlikable, which brings me to the bigger question of this book. Were we supposed to like any of these people? So I'm starting to wonder if we're supposed to like any Primaris. Because so many Primaris come off as we've been in the making for 10,000 years. You know, like look at Baraccio like listing off his accolades before he was, you know, converted by call. Okay. Yes, you were hot. You were something hot 10,000 years ago. It's been a, it's been a spell. You've been in a vat since then. Um, what have you done for me lately type thing? Um, but these, all of these Primaris, and we even saw it in uh, the Wolf Time book, that these Primaris Marines feel like they have something to prove and that they feel like they are so much better than everybody else. And there's always been this kind of disconnect between Space Marines and regular humans. They always, they're like, even in the Horace Heresy novels, they talk about it's like the weakness bothers them. The fear, the sense of fear bothers them. And the Primaris, it's just like, it's gone over the top. It's 10 times. It is, but I'm, I'm going to push back on that. Because, well, I think you're totally right about like the people. That's fair. But like when he went to Ma, it's basically like, I don't give a shit what Seth says. That was so weird. Especially. Really? Especially, really? especially because that means the relics. The relics, dude. You're going to destroy yeah. the relics? You want to blow the relics sky high? Well, and. The amount of times that like Dama would be like, we're going to do this. And then all of a sudden he has five people who are like, I don't want to do that. Should we do? I think we should do this instead. Again, I've seen world leaders who respect the chain of command more than these people do. Like, w again, where did you learn this? Where did you learn that it's a fucking democracy? Excuse my language. Like the, it, the whole thing. What? The Imperium's not a democracy? I know. Like, where did you people come from that, and again, did you learn this from Gulliman? Was it like Gulliman was like, I want you to do this. And they were like, mm, I got questions. I don't think we should be doing that. Or just say no. Like, but again, were we meant to like any of these people? I actually, I have to pull up the exact quote because it made my heart happy and my heart grew three sizes. <laughs> um, was, it's it, actually at the very end, it's on page 330 and it's when he's fighting the first disciple hmm. and the first disciple says um he's talking about how he's he's fought flesh terrors over the years and he's like they were warriors worthy of the title of the divine rage that forever tests tears at your bloodline you are a petulant child by comparison the whole book i kept referring to him as a petulant man child and then the fact i can't tell like, in that moment, I was like, okay, we're not supposed to like this character at all. Or is that just the bad guy being bad? Okay, for people who um, have the copy of the book, this is page 353. Oh, sorry. Mine's on digital. Yeah. Um, and it's on iBooks, so the pages are exciting. I never know what page I'm on. I can't um, believe you use iBooks. So it's where my husband started buying everything because I'm, he is an Apple boy at heart. I'm and so now using iBooks. <sighs> okay, so here's the thing. That's where he started purchasing them because, you know, he's an Apple Luddite. And um but now I'm like, but we have to have all of our Warhammer 40k books together. We can't buy anything on Kindle or any other place. It has to all be together in one cohesive place. So now I'm stuck using iBooks. And yes, for those of you wondering at home, is it really that bad? Mm. It is. It is. Uh, it is very bad. Um, no, he was using iBooks because it was native on there, and he's afraid to learn new technology. Let's be he's honest. a Luddite. Yeah. Yes, I love my husband to death. He's a Luddite. Um, I, I basically have a boomer in a Gen X body as a husband. Um, yeah. But, like, it, it's just, I, I, I almost think I got to that point, and I was like, oh, you know. You know we're not supposed to like any of these people. And I'm asking that not judgmentally. I, I, I honestly want to know if you're listening to this and you were like, I love the Flesh Terrors and I loved these characters. 
please, please. Ex- why? And I'm not saying that judgmentally, like, oh, why? No, I mean, like, help it. me understand. <laughs> like, help very- me understand. Uh, like, again, just help me understand. Because I, especially Damal, I hated him from start to finish. And just when I thought I couldn't hate him anymore, I could. I was willing to give him a chance. And then, no. And uh, I lost it with Baraccio when he killed his assistant. That was the point at which... And I was like, dude, she's... nothing for him. We're 100% correct in everything that she's been saying. She has <sighs> not said anything wrong. And... Well, and I loved when she flat out said to him, she was like, don't give him any more ammunition, please. Yes. Yeah. Although... I did hate later when Damal was like, oh, what happened to your little assistant? A, how do you know about that? And he goes, oh, was she hitting a little too close to the truth? It was Barakiel and her and Aisha in a room. How do you know what was said? He knows everything. All right. Author knowledge, not character knowledge. Sorry, that one really frustrated me. I, well, I'm trying. Actually, I didn't understand the point of that because he, cause he's like, what, are you going to chastise me for killing her? I was like, I don't care what you did to her. Well, then why did you bring this up? Like, why did you bring it up? I don't understand. I am trying not to be so. <laughs> Wine might have been a bad choice. Um, I am trying not to be super like hateful and 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 rude about this book. I I just, God, it just it it did not hit with me. Um, what I'm wondering so... though is, is that I didn't rate this book on Goodreads. Because I'm not sure if it was fair for me to give it a rating. Because it's just like, I hated this book because I hate the characters and I hate the flesh tears. So that to me does not seem fair to to give it a low rating because I hate everybody in it. Right. Because we all have those things, right? Like, totally. We just Oh my God. Like, I don't like this one chapter. Therefore, I'm not going to like the book. I'm not going to give it a rating because... It could be the most well-written masterpiece ever, but I did not like that. No, I'm not saying that Fehavari was good. It's not. Okay? The books are bad. The writing was bad. He should feel bad. Going back to it, why are you trying not to laugh? I want to adept. If you listen to this video, I want you to know that I love you and maybe not entirely in a workplace-appropriate manner. So I was like, what is the Goodreads rating on this? And so I pulled it up. <laughs> and Skywatcher Adept is doing the God Emperor's work. His <laughs> is the first review. <laughs> he gives it three stars. And it says one of the most popular words used in Wrath of the Lost are blood 600 times, rage 195 times, death 189 times, wrath. 158 times and i want you to know right okay, now wait, hold actually, on a second you need to go back and recount because that wrath was used way more than 100 I, times i just i want to see your math skywatcher adept please provide the receipts and kill 158 times and um and the next review is a person who says the book begins with a lot of bickering and flailing about which makes the flesh terrorists look like less reasonable and focused world eaters <laughs> So we're not alone here. I love both of these human beings right now. Well, what I was um, going to say is, is that when I'm wondering... Can you, sorry? Hold on. Let me get my thought out, and then you can say the next funny thing. I just said continue, please. I'm oh, okay. sorry. Is that because we hate them so much, isn't that a sign of good writing? Maybe that we're supposed to hate them? And he did good by making us hate him? And, well, okay, so here's this again, though, this goes back to my existential question, which is, are we supposed to like these characters? If the answer is no, then yes, I agree with your your assertion. I totally ag- assertion assertion. Wow. Well, you know what? On- I recommend Book Cliff's Vineyards, Petite Verdot. When you read this book. Okay, so um, I will have to anyway, say... I totally listening, agree with your assertion. There. Listen to Audible. One of the uh, narrators are all British, naturally. What? I know. 
he with said, my Warhammer? He said something that was just like, record scratch. What did you just say? He said, disorientated. You know what? That doesn't surprise me. I actually work with a lot of British people and some of the words that come out of their mouth and British educated people and some of the words that come out of their mouths. I'm like, come again? So I got to um, ask all you Brits, why do you like adding extra letters and adding extra syllables? <laughs> it's the, it's the, oh my God. It's the emphasis on certain syllables. I'm like, Whoa, mm. disorientated. I was like, you mean disoriented? Like there's no tated in there. But then... I have to ask, like, do we as Americans, like, do we sound like super weird? And they actually, I know the answer to that is yes. Because again, I work with a British educated man and we were both going back and forth in a call one day and he had said a word. And then I was like, oh, I don't know that you know how that word is said. And so then I said it back. And then like immediately later, he was like, yes, and said the word again. And I was like, oh, shit. And we went back and forth like that where I would just be like, oh, and then we're going to use this word. And then he would be like, yes, I agree. We should use this word. <laughs> it's like, this is dueling banjos right now. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get into a fight over linguistics and pronunciation. Um, anyways, I think your assertion is very much correct. If, if we were not meant to like these characters, then yes, he did a bang up job. If we were, though, and I really find it hard uh, to believe if, that... If we were, he, he screwed the pooch. I mean... <laughs> yes. Because I think of, like, I think of how many books we have read with delightful villains. Right? Like, I'm looking directly at you, Apocalypse. Um, hmm. We, like, you can write characters who That's are bad fair, characters. Jen. You can't compare everybody to Josh Reynolds. It's fair. May how, he, well, you know may what? he rest in peace. Right. His writing. Um, okay, that could be fair. I, But like I think about movies like Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. You're not supposed to like Henry. You're supposed to be invested in his story. And it's Michael Rooker, so everybody kind of wants to like him. But he's a horrible human being. Like right. a horrible human being. Any villain so that like, Alan Rickman ever plays. Right, right. Like you are not supposed to like Hans Gruber. You are supposed to find him interesting and be intrigued. The thing was, not only did I not like these characters, I wasn't intrigued in their story. Oh, dang. That's a good point. And, like, so here, let's, Ugh. let's, we're going to skip over one question and go to the next two because we're talking specifically about Dama and Baracchio. Like, was Dama right? It, it, no. Are any of us right? But, like, is the death company name necessary? Is it? A good idea for the flesh terrors. The flesh terrors uh, are renowned know, for the black rage issues. So, I understand. On the one hand, I understand he doesn't want to put them down like rabid dogs. I understand that. And there is, from a certain point of view, a use for the death company. I mean, Lamart or Lamartez, however you say his name, I would say the French way, Lamart. He, uh, he has found, you know, the way he leads the death company and the way his, you know, leash chaplain <laughs> leads the death company, they're very good at how they do it. Of course, it is the blood angels. It's a little better. And these people that's well known in the death company, they're not totally rageaholics the entire time either. So, and I, so I understand, yes, they could have a purpose. I mean, they are great cannon fodder. Hey, oh my hey, look, it's Horace go it's like honestly one of my favorite memes is that imperial guard meme where it's it's like uh you're being attacked and he's all sad he's like the space marines are here and he's all smiling and then he goes back to sad he's like they're calling you horus <laughs> it's like yeah <laughs> that's not a, <laughs> they're calling you horus yeah that that that's not a good time uh um, no so i see a purpose for them but i mean the problem with the flesh tear is at least with this group is that they don't have him under control. Oh. At least Lamart has the death company under control, or at least as much control as he can. Does and I guess I and this is this is wholly on me. I will totally take this as a me thing because I'm not super invested in the Blood Angels in general. I guess I never realized that it was so contagious that like. 
Because basically they talk about how you can't keep these guys around because just being in proximity to them will give people the black rage. I didn't realize it was the flu. I think that's the flesh terror thing because I've never seen that with the blood angels before. Yeah, like I had never. They try to get them away. You know, they isolate them because they're going on a berserker rage. And they're going to kill everybody. Mm-hmm. Yes, but it's the same thing when a blood angel goes on, gets attacked by the red thirst. They also have to get them away. It's not because they're contagious. It's because they can't be controlled. They're out of their mind. Because they basically turn into... A rabid dog. Frankly, kind of like world eaters at that point. They are in a cornite rage and they just need... Their bloodlust is up. Yes. Like, I totally get that. But, like, I guess... And here's the thing that I would say. Like, now that they've established that it is basically the flu and that being near you... I guess they should mask up. um, What I wonder... I'm sorry. Just because, just from what I know of the Black Rage. So the thing with right. the Black Rage is that one thing that was established in a couple of Mephiston books, uh, not the ones Darius Hinks wrote, but the ones that um, Annadale wrote, was that the Black Rage is always there, like right there. So it's always a constant control to kind of keep it at bay. And sometimes some blood angels, they just get so given up, they just fall into it because they just, the world's not worth living. So they just kind of fall into it. But the flesh terrors, I think, because they are so rage heavy and battle lust, is that it is kind of contagious. Because because when one goes on the black rage, they start attacking everybody. And the others, they get their blood lust up and they start. And then it's very when the when you're into that mode, when the the total the attacking the blood rage, blood rage, the blood lust, that's when you're the most susceptible to the black rage. And so I think why it's contagious with the flesh tears is because they are so susceptible to getting into that blood rust blood lust <laughs> they're so susceptible to getting into that rage yes i could see that i mean i guess i could see that but like when they were in the ship like brachial talks about basically going in to like see i think it was isaiah he goes in to see isaiah and he's like oh like i'm starting to feel like, I'm starting to feel sick just being in his presence. Like, that's, that's nothing the stuff. I've ever known. Um, and all my readings in the Blood Angels, nothing I've ever seen. I had never seen that before. And part of me was like, am I missing something? Like, have I just never? Because I'm so, I'm so loath to read about the Blood Angels, the Euro Trash Space Vampires, that. I, I kind of, I was like, you know what? It's entirely possible. I've just missed this particular brand of flavor text. But, and given that the flesh terrors are so prone to it, that they are renowned for getting into these blood rages and that they are known, renowned for getting their blood up. And they're in like, I mean, I think they've said like, basically the number one cause of death for flesh terrors is the black rage. Yes. So like, it seems to me that as the flesh terrors creating a death company is extremely irresponsible, especially when you are crossing the rift. Like you guys are it is you are down on your blood supplies. You are making a very perilous journey. You're the flesh terrors, and you, you want to make a death company. And you are a very green chaplain. Like you, I it. it they're it, all green. That's the thing. They're all green. And he was so his lust for power. Like when they basically after uh, Tantheus dies, and he's like, figure out a way to make everybody vote for me to be the leader here. Um, and like he kept it with that one Crozius when he's just like, oh, God, God, I gotta carry that guy's Crozius. Like, ew. Like, you are so power hungry. And I didn't really understand why, other than he wanted this death company because he had like this religious fervorance for it. And it's like, I forget the name of the chaplain who actually runs the death company in the Blood Angels. He's like basically Lamarck's per- personal therapist. But he helps run it. It's not. I don't think it's Azeroth. I don't think it's it. Shoot, no, isn't it? Isn't it because we always we just read that book about him. It's not not Azeroth. No, it's not. It's not. It's not Azeroth. I can't think of who it is then. It's a. It's. It doesn't matter. He's in the Lamart book. If I really cared, I'd run back there and grab it and look it up. But he wants to be him. Yeah, he does. And I. I don't know why, but that type of naked ambition in Space Marines doesn't ever sit well with me. 
I think it's and a I, Primaris thing, to be honest. Like these Primaris, they just be. have these delusions of grandeur. Like they just want to fit in so bad, you know, instead of. That could be. You know, just trying to fit in. They're just like, I'm going to lead everything. No, that's really not how this works. That's really not how this works. And you guys are, you guys are very new. And I, di I, I guess, oh man, I was not a big fan of that. But then, and I know we already kind of touched on this, but Barakiel's journey then of this, I'm going to cure the Black Rage. Really? Like, and I know we've already kind of talked about this, but the hubris there. And right. everyone's telling you, it ain't a thing, dude. Like, Darren is like, yeah, there's nothing on Cretacea. Okay, like, Cretacea, to, which his big grim warning about, don't look for secrets there. They hold no, like. All he had to do was tell him. We tried and it we failed spectacularly. It failed, like, badly. One of my favorite lines from the 1984 version of Dune is when she tells Paul Atreides to put his hand in the box. And uh, he's like, oh, thousands, she's like, thousands have tried. And he's like, they tried and failed. And she says, they tried and died. Like, I feel like that's all he had to say. We've tried. Oh, and they failed? They died. <laughs> like, it, it's such a, it, it, and I don't know, maybe the flesh chair is like, why do none of you speak plainly? Like, just, because the just movie come out and be like, happen. oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> let me get, let me get off your back about that. Um. Basically, yeah. Yeah, and just, again, like, and, and the part that really frustrated me with those two is, like, when Dama is, like, throwing them at the fortress, and Brachial's like, bruh, we're not getting through that force field. Shut up! I know! You guys are supposed to be joint leading. When did you just become the de facto leader? Did we forget yeah, that was... that plot point happened? I don't know. The whole thing was so weird. The whole dynamic was so weird because it's like, you guys inspired one another to become an apothecary and become a chaplain. Why are you guys enemies like all the time? I don't, I don't understand. Like, I, understand. I missed a conversation somewhere. Yeah, like, I don't, I, I, I don't know. Is it, is it over the death company? Is that what it is? Because why can't you guys go do this together? Why don't you try to help him try to find the cure if you know that there is no cure? What's the harm? Like, why are you fighting this? And I, ugh. So there is a very interesting thing that gets thrown out here. Actually, there's a couple of interesting things. So they show up on the planet. They find a Alpha Legion ship, mm -hmm. which basically gets dropped like a hot potato. All right. Uh, like, and I, I'm assuming. I think the Alpha Legion turned the flesh terrors that were there. And then the flesh terror is like, I, we have no use for you, and then killed them all, which I think is kind of... I strongly suspect that's what happened here. But that's real neato. Like, I wasn't very invested in that. And there is, of course, the whole, like, oh, it is your destiny to become Cornites. And, yeah, yeah, yeah we've, we've seen that before. Um, yeah, Combanda said the same thing. The same yeah, Combanda says what's well. up. And uh, uh, it, didn't, it didn't work then. Yeah, it, 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 I think about, I've, I've gone on record as saying I don't, I don't like that particular plot point within the Horus Heresy as a background for them. I'm not a big fan of the whole Kabanda thing. I'm just, I'm just not. Um, Man, but, that's like a core battle. <laughs> yeah. In the heresy. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and I'm not judging anybody who likes that. I totally get it. Again, that this is why the Warhammer 40k universe is so amazing, is that of all the, there's, there's 18 legions for a reason. Right, because everybody's going to find something they love, and everyone's going to find something they don't love, and that is what makes it so amazing. So I'm not judging. I'm not saying it's wrong. I like if you love that, more power to you. Right? I like some no, of the other shit. I'm just laughing that of all the things in the Horus Heresy to strongly dislike, like that's like something that's been like in the Horus Heresy Codex since the beginning of Warhammer 40k time. It's just it's it's just funny to me. That's all. Oh, you know, that's 100% valid. It's it's just one of those things that I'm like, not my thing. Um, And that's fine because there's other, again, and I'm going to say the word stupid because, again, this is how I play the game. It's like Megamind. He like insults, like, now you insult me back. This is how the game is played. Well, they, um, when I was reading the there's book, other stupid shit that I like. There's, I was reading the <laughs> book on Moloch and I was like... Who cares about anything on this planet with the knights? Like, I don't understand. Only to find out, oh, this was actually, like, a really big pivotal point 
in the original Horus Heresy Codex. I'm like, okay, I don't see a point to it, but carry on. <laughs> you, yeah. Um, but the one really big so the big flesh terrors mythos is that what happened to Nasser Amit, right? They found his armor, but not him. And nobody really knows. We know that really nobody gets out of the flesh terrors alive without going to the black rage. So question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, when he's basically like, Oh yeah, Nasser Amit fell to corn. My reaction to that was okay. Like they like games workshop. that could descend from the heavens and be like, Oh, that's true. And I'd be like, all right. Okay. Tracks. Or they could come down and be like, that's not true. And I'd be like, okay. I mean, I don't know why I'd listen to a, a cult, a uh, chaos and space Marine. Let's be honest. I get all my information. What are you talking about? Okay. Valid. Beacons of truth. Yeah. Beacons um, of truth. One of us always what? tells the truth and one of us always lies. <laughs> Would he tell me that this door leads me there? Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, would he tell me that Amit fell to chaos? Um, does it matter? Like, I feel like this is part of, like, the tragedy that I'm always like, mm, I don't know. It, it just doesn't resonate with me. And I'm very eloquent tonight because I've had almost three glasses of wine. Well, now. and also, uh, like, again, like, I don't care about the watered down chapters. So I don't care about this. You know, Amit guy. I don't care about the flesh terrors. I don't care about any of this. When you're talking about the flesh terrors, it's blooded down, not watered down. Oh, I'm down. sorry. Etaid down? It's now a verb. Why not? Fight me. Hey, makes sense to me. If we get into a fight over the flesh terrors, I'm going to be very disappointed in us. Um, I just want everybody to know. But if, if we do or we don't, I'm confused. If we do. Oh. If we get into a fight and we're just like, ah! Of the flesh terrors, I'm going to be like, we need to reassess our lives right now. But that would be so flesh terror of us <laughs> to get into a fight. <laughs> over this That's stupid... why we must not succumb. <laughs> over this stupid chapter. Yes, I said stupid, and I'm not sorry. I will grip my chain axe and feel my angel's teeth come out. That is my new trigger phrase, y'all. If I have to read about angel's teeth slipping the gums one more time. Okay, note to future self. Phrasing. I can't drink in podcast. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I can't let you drink alone. So. Oh, you cannot. No. It's like part of the contract when we decided to do this podcast together was we don't drink alone. We don't drink alone. Who lets our friends drink alone? Rude people. That's true. Um. I have an early morning wake up call too, so future me is going to be real angry at flesh terror me. But I needed a lot of booze to get through this yeah, guy. Well, so my kids are off school for the next four days because winter break, y'all. So drinking up. Oh my god! Well, actually, mine is she has to school tomorrow, but then she's off on Monday and Tuesday, and we go get her driver's permit. So maybe now is a good time to be drinking because I've got to deal with flesh terrors, and my child is about to be driving my car. Um help um i just like that was one of those things that i was like actually the whole thing about cretacea and i even said to you i was like there's a point where this had better be worth it we had better get to the end of this book and i'm like whoa that's an actual like a full keanu reeves whoa because that's a big reveal i don't feel like so that happened oh god um, no. you like, you've revealed that they tried to cure the rage. What a shock. And it um, failed. No, and it don't failed say. Dramatically. Um, okay. Um, you revealed that Nasser Amit may or may not have fallen to corn. Okay. Uh, you revealed that the Alpha Legion may or may not be involved, which... I mean, that's like the whole Warhammer 40k in a nutshell. The Alpha Legion may or may not be involved. If the Alpha Legion, if this was their grand plan, was to be like, oh, let's turn the flesh there to Cowern. Ambitious, aren't you? <laughs> uh, like, this this was the chapter that you chose to focus on? A very Honestly, small chapter I think that's very was, fatalistic? I think this is some random war band that was like, I don't like those guys. 
And those then, guys in particular. I, it's really what I think because it's a small, some random war band is like, we're just going to go mess with these guys. And well, they fuck or, they fucked around and found out. <laughs> so Basically, yes. And I'm going to go ahead and try to fix this book in the style of the drinker, the critical drinker, hmm. which is that one of the things that he touched on very early in the book, because we're going to talk about like how this is broken into four parts. With the gene stealers thing, he actually touched on something very interesting where he talks about how like this, the tyrannid conscience basically is like, yeah, we hate the blood angels and we hate these guys in particular, because that was kind of, that's been very heavily alluded to in all of the devastation of ball books and everything that came after that, that yeah, the Tyranids are very angry at the Blood Angels because y'all dealt us a pretty heavy blow. Hive Leviathan is out for blood. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. <laughs> all right. No pun intended, but an excellent pun nonetheless. I think we can all agree on that. Um, but there was a very interesting moment when they're flight fighting the Gene Stealers. The one, the Magus, like, unleashes that weapon on Isaiah. And they're like... It doesn't hurt us at all. But then Isaiah immediately goes into the Black Rage. A much more interesting book utilizing the Gene Stealers basically would have been something along the lines as if the Tyranids had basically discovered, oh, y'all turn useless as soon as you go into this Black Rage thing. And we can basically curtail you and corral you because we've triggered this in you and made you mindless berserkers. Yes, you're dangerous, but also not necessarily fully there. Mm -hmm. I actually thought it would have been much more interesting if they would have dealt with that concept that the Tyranids are like, oh, we know your number and we know your secret and we know how to beat you. I actually think that would have been a much more interesting story than going to all of this Cretacea thing and taking back Cretacea. Like, was anyone, and this is an honest question out there because if, if so, then I stand corrected, but was anybody actually sitting around going... I wonder what happened to Cretacea with them going to ball. Flesh Terrors fans. Like, if that was legit a question weighing on your mind, then I retract all of my criticism. I don't know. This. Like, Honestly, I don't think Seth was even worried about it. I think he wanted to get rid of the Primaris. Or as he put it, in Devastation to Ball, Ultramarines and Flesh Terrors clothing. Well, because, I mean, that's basically the first disciple says that too. He's like, <laughs> he didn't even know this planet was taken over. He just sent y'all here to get rid of you. Like, that guy's little barbs were mm -hmm. so accurate. But I wasn't invested in that. I didn't care about that. I actually found the whole Gene Stealers and the whole uh, Tyrannus. And every, everybody who listens to this podcast regularly knows that I am over the Gene Stealers and I'm mostly over the Nids. But the idea that the Nids are basically now have a blood vendetta against the Blood Angels and all of their successor chapters, I actually find kind of interesting. That, like... This seemingly mindless hive mind. You've pissed them off and insulted them, like, spiritually. I actually find that super interesting. And that would be my fix for this book, is that they would have focused on that. They would have focused on them trying to bring back in the worlds and the space stations that were all around their, um, their home world. And it's basically the Nids going, we know how to make you guys not as functional as you could be. Like, we figured something out. I think it's funny that you say that. Because I have a text from you. Por qué? Oh, no. That says, if it's the fucking Nids, I'm going to fucking lose it. Oh. Yes, if it would have just been a straight up flesh terrors versus Nids, I would have lost it. I would have hated this book even more. And the, but the strange thing is, I would have liked it more because it would have made <laughs> sense. Because it's right after Devastation of Ball. It would have made sense. Okay, you know what? I can't even disagree with that. Like, the idea that... And I hate the Nids. Like, we still have to deal with the Nids, but I kind like, of like Jen the Jen is idea. tired of the Nids. I've always hated them. And I think bringing them in would have made a better story. I really have to I really have to think that it would have. I really have to think that it would have been a stronger story, a better story, and it would have been more interesting, frankly, if they it could have, have talked about how it would have these the, uh, things... black rage in more cohesively as well. I I can't disagree with it because 
again, this isn't like Knights of McCrag, which Knights of McCrag was told in two very distinct pieces. There's the horror piece, and then there's the, the hell is going on here piece, right? What is wrong with Fair. this planet? <laughs> we have read plenty of books in the past where it's been broken up into one, two, or three parts where it's like, okay, this is this part of this story, and then this happens, and then this happens. And this felt so disjointed because it was, okay. I thought this one was parts for the sake of having parts. Yes. I thought the same thing. And that goes back to my husband's core argument, which was that maybe this was a short story or maybe even two short stories that got dragged out into one central book. Maybe. Which I say again, por qué? We've seen that happen before. Which, if that is what happened, that's not fair to poor Chris Forrester. It isn't. It really isn't. But there's just so much redundancy in this book that I felt like it was padding the also, length. A shame on the editor in this book. I'm sorry. This might be one of the worst edited books I've ever read. And here's the thing, too. Oh, wait, if we have British... I shouldn't say, have... I shouldn't say editor. Your proofreading skills, Mr. Editor, are shameful. Yes, they are. Um, and it starts about the halfway mark, where all of a sudden um, lines of dialogue start without punctuation. And it's not like a, where are you going, comma, he interjected. Like, right, um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's very bright today, comma, he yeah. interjected, we start, comma. We start sentences of dialogue out. with no capitalization. No capitalization. And... One of the big things, and I would actually, I would query any of our British, British people on here, is that the the misuse of some words, I was like, do you not know what this word means? Or does this have a very different meeting in British English? The word that I'm going to look at. I uh, point knew to, you were going to bring this up. I can't, I can't not. The number of times he uses the word soporific. Because he uses soporific as synonymous with a painkiller. And it is not. Soporific specifically refers to things that are like tranquilizers or make you sleepy. He uses it correctly a couple times because when you have somebody who's in the black rage, you are going to want a soporific. Something that's going to just like, night, night, night. But he talks about like, oh, the pain, soporifics. Like you're, You've broken your arm and you're taking NyQuil? I mean, Weird flex, what, but okay. That, that's what I do. I mean. <laughs> that's how I treat all of my medical ailments. Go to sleep. Oh my god, I sprained my ankle. Give me the NyQuil. I mean, isn't that the best way to get rid of pain? Go to sleep. True. I mean, it's one of the reasons that Dramamine is such an effective motion sickness cure is it puts you to sleep. Right. <laughs> uh, you don't feel motion you sickness. You can't be throwing anymore. up if you're sick. Right. If you're asleep, right? Um, <laughs> but like, it was things like that where I'm like, and there were a few words like that throughout where I was like, that's not quite the right word you were looking for, friend. And it wasn't a difference between British English and American English. It was just straight up the wrong word. And I feel, and there were $5 words. A lot of them were $5 words that I was like, somebody needs to take this guy's thesaurus away. Um, but it feels as though a good proofreader would have been like, not the word you want there, friend. There are other $5 words we could use. I mean, and I know for you, it was particularly hard. Well, I mean, that's why I've actually, I'm in the process of creating a Warhammer 40k bingo card. There are $5 words on there because there are some that authors use all the damn time. All the time, time. And you could tell when what did i text you the other night because you can tell when they discovered new words um fusty 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 which again i okay i missed that I because i was speed reading <laughs> fusty is a real word i want to make that clear fusty is a real word um it is not one that you encounter very often in american english um typically it's more musty um Fusty does have a very specific reason, but oh my god, everything became fusty after a certain point. Like, everything smelled fusty. The bones were fusty. The crypt was fusty. The reliquarium was fusty. This area of the ship was fusty. And I was just like, no. No. Like, why would you use the... 
maybe again, maybe it's a British English American English thing, and I'm totally willing to admit that, but there were a lot of words that he used a lot for like sections of the book, and then yeah. they disappear entirely. It needed a better editor. So let me ask you this as our final question for the evening, because I feel like we've gone all over the place here. Where do the flesh terrors go from here? I don't care. <laughs> I don't. I didn't want to read this book in the first place because I hate the flesh terrors. So I'm kind of pissed that I actually have a hard copy of this. And you missed it. And so... It's really funny that you say that because last night when I finished the book, I was like, I'm so glad I bought this digitally. I'm glad that we read the book because, and I was explaining this to my daughter who got a, but we had to drive to a hockey practice and I, she got an earful. Um, I was just like, well, you didn't realize you just strapped yourself in for a TED talk, kid. As we drove 40 minutes to the rink, um, because it's snowing yet again here in Denver. Um, the, I, I guess you're right. I just, I don't really care that much what happens to this chapter after this. Um, I am, we always give a, we give an author three chances, right? Peter Vahavari got two, and I think we all agreed that we're not going to give him a third chance. Um, Chris Forrester's a new writer. I we quit. haven't seen. I will fair. quit. <laughs> fair. make me write, read another uh, one of his books. Those two books, like it wasn't like a thing with like Mike Brooks where we read um, Rites of Passage and we were like, there's some potential here, but some things we didn't like. And then we read Brutal Cunning and we were like, oh my God, like this guy really is a talented author. Mm -hmm. And then, right. So like, or like Josh Reynolds, right. Where we read a bunch of stuff and we were like, oh my God, this is all really good. And we really like this. Chris Wright, uh, Aaron Dembski Bowden, like, uh, Oh, I'm willing to give new authors new chances. I'm willing to give stories new chances. We haven't really seen a book about the flesh terrors. And I do think in the wake of Devastation of Ball, there kind of was a question amongst the fandom of like, what are they going to do now with the Primaris? Okay, fair, great. I'm glad we read this book for that reason and that reason alone. But I got to the end of this book and was like, I don't care. And his next book better impress. Not, I'm not, you better impress me. No, but I mean like, for me to want to continue with this author, I agree with you completely. I'm like, well, this is not a good first outing for me, no. personally. No, or for me. Like, Very he, clear on the personal portion. He wrote, okay, he did write a short story in Cthonia's Reckoning, and I do have that anthology, so I might check that out. Yep, that's. Because, I mean, and he could be a short story writer because. I have read two Peter Fehavari short stories. And they were And you good. said they were pretty good. They were good. So maybe it's a thing that they're short story writers. There's always that that possibility. That could be. Yeah. I am um... But you know, I you know, and I always say like I don't care about the watered down successor chapters, and that's totally true. I just think that it comes to the blood angels i think they're too close to the space wolves like they're they're uh gene seed their genetic their dna is too unstable you get plus past the blood angels and you got straight up vampires you have straight up vampire and you know, some part of me, and this is this is a meta commentary. This has nothing to do with Chris Forrester. I want to make that very clear. This is more meta commentary. I feel as though there has been a trend in recent years because we have the space wolves, because we have these basically space werewolves, and they have established multiple times that they can't have successor chapters because their gene seed is so unstable. Mm -hmm. I feel feel as though some authors really like to lean into the vampires versus werewolves thing and like well we've got one chapter that's basically just whole cloth va uh, werewolves let's just make chapters that are whole cloth vampires no two and i i'm with you in that i'm starting to be like you know a lot of these chapters are 
sticks and unstable. And I'm starting to ask myself, why were you, why do you have successor chapters at all? Like, declare yourselves like the space wolves and be like, oh yeah, we've got numbers? Question mark? Like, we're not, we're not going to tell you how many we have. <laughs> like, maybe we have a thousand, maybe we have four thousand, who knows? I mean, um, you know, but we're all blind. I mean, after the Tyranids came. Yes. Yeah. And they all got devoured. Like, how many do um, we really have? Yeah. I mean, Golden I... basically came and hugged Dante and was just like, you're my golden child. You may do whatever you wish. And then oh, he went back home. And then he went back home and kicked Marnius Calgar. <laughs> you donkey! Exactly. I love um, that meme. It's one of my favorites. Um, yeah, no, I agree with that. And it's a thing that I really don't like. And I know the flesh, the flesh terrors. And look, I'm going to use a phrase that has definitely been abused in recent years, but I feel as though I'm using it correct. The flesh terrors have always been a little edgelordy. They've always been a little like edgelords. But this book really leaned into that. And I, I do not want to see that. I could not take the vampire porn. Just the constant, I really want to kill them or rip off their arms, but I'm not going to do it. Oh my gosh, that carotid artery is just calling to me, but I'm not going to do anything. Stop. Just stop. On a question, did a single flesh terror in this book have a single conversation with a normal baseline human in which they weren't eyeing their carotid artery? No. Um, did a single flesh terror oh, have yes. a conversation? Yes. With Etain. Because she's Fair. too busy, you know, cutting him down a notch. Yeah. Did a flesh terror have a conversation with another flesh terror in which they did not envision pulping their skulls? No. Like, again, just the edgelord vampire porn. Look, you guys, I am of a certain age. I survived the 90s. I survived Vampire the Masquerade. I... I'm she good with that saying. The Anne Rice era. I survived the Anne Rice era. I survived again. Like Vampire the Masquerade was a thing. All right, it was everywhere. Uh, the Edge Lords were out, and just I, I just can't. I th this this hits so. Many, I have PTSD. Um, this hits so many just tones of the vampirism. I'm with you on that. Like. Again, I want to say, like, oh, it's kind of like near dark, but mm, it was kind of vampire porn. And just the fact that everybody was just itching for a fight. My husband's gag was he was like, they're like the world eaters who listened to the cure and they want to kill everything, but they're sad about it. And more like stabbing westward. Like, I, I, I just pictured the whole time I read this book, I was like, oh, a stabbing westward album is playing. And if you were from the 90s, you know exactly which album I'm talking about. I'm still um, I'm giggling at because we all listened to it. I'm, um, I'm giggling at listening to the Cure. It, it's not it's not unfair. Like they were definitely kind of they they felt bad about it afterward. Much kind, afterward, kind of? assuming they didn't. Yeah, assuming they didn't fall to the Black Rage. I mean, kind of, but not really. I mean, he didn't have any regret. He killed Asia. No. Like no. good luck trying to find a good Medicaid. You've killed everybody. You guys go through them like Kleenex. Also, I... how are you guys going to get back? You ate everybody. You're stuck on Cretacea now. If I was at Tain, I hope you like it. If I was at Tain, I'd be like, later. And later. Yeah. Like, we're out now. Wait. One of your fuckboys... Tried to kill the navigator. Oh, yeah. That did happen. Remember when that happened? Yeah. yeah, that happened at one point. Like, you... And you've now established that the Black Rage is as contagious as the flu. Like, some people get the norovirus. Some people get the Black Rage. Very contagious. Um, I... <laughs> cross yourself because the norovirus is going around our area right now. Um... I, like, again, it, there was just so much about this book that just did not land with me. And I honestly, I asked that question because I was like, I got to the end of this book and was like, I don't care about any of these people. 
I don't care what happens next. I don't care. Nope. Yeah. Which, that can be brought on Cretaceous as far as I care. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. I, I kind of, I want to like Gabriel Seth. I really want to like him as a character. But uh, his people suck. I liked him in Devastation of Ball, and I thought he was pretty commanding here. He uh, was, but even he was like, when he's like gripping his chain axe, talking to the people, I'm like, calm down. You're supposed to be the adult. <laughs> I mean, he was barely an adult in Devastation of Ball. Like, here Dante's trying to have a moment with him, and he's just like, why are you doing this? Get away. Like, right. Dante's trying to be nice. Like, give the old man a bone. <laughs> yes, like, like, just calm down. He's um, 1,500 years old, at least. Like, be nice to the old man. Seriously. Just be nice. It's, I don't know. I, here's the really funny thing about this, is that I think you and I are both kind of over Cadians in general. But the idea that we're reading Katie and Blood next has me like, oh, good. <laughs> I'm, like, triggered that it has the word blood in the title of the book, to be totally honest. Like, should we go check Goodreads to see if Skywatcher Adept kindly counted all the numbers of blood times blood was used? I mean, I'm sure... Oh, great. I was like, I'm sure the blood's not mentioned in here very often, but now I'm seeing it here on the back. Yep. I have a co physical copy of this and don't have to use my tablet. Um. It oh, good. It's in parts. That's my tablet and not my book. Oh, good. Um, I'm very excited. I know it's an older book. I am. You know what? I'm going to be really honest and say, though, I'm kind of excited to go into the Wayback Machine for this because I would like to go back to when things were normal and we didn't have to have a bunch of Primaris Marines walking around slashing their wrists over the fact that they're never going to be real flesh terrorists. You know, I'm kind of done with the Primaris. I can't have him too. The only exception to that is Lucerne, and that's because Lucerne's amazing. And Felix. I was going to say Felix. I miss oh, Felix. Oh, so Lucerne, much. he's the Black Templar with the sense of humor. Yes. Like, I, I want more of them, but I'm very excited. I know we have to go into the way back. Um, yeah, you gotta do what you gotta do, friends. I am excited for this book, though. I think it'll be a really welcome change. I'm kind of... This book turned me off Space Marines for a little while. Like, I want to read a book about normal humans for a second with their petty human problems that seem somehow less petty than the Space Marine problems. Uh, I think all problems are... Let's be real. World Eater problems are less petty than Flesh Terror problems. Where's the lie? I mean, I've seen Dark Angels less petty. As my daughter would say, on God. On God? On God. So my daughter is doing driver's ed online and she was like, bah, 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 bah. and I had to go and translate for my husband because she was like, bro, spitting straight cap. This guy, though, like, oh, my God, I was like. She's saying that he's lying and that what he is saying is unfactual or just straight up bullshit. Um, but yeah, she kept going. She's like, somebody would say something and she would go, on God. Okay, truthful. I get it. Okay, um, okay that makes sense because Gabe will say spitting on cap. I'm like, what are you saying? Okay, and here's the thing too. If somebody is Gen Z enough, because I am definitely too Gen X to understand this particular phrasing. Because generally, like, being a linguistics major, I can look at some slang and be like, okay, I understand how we got here. Like when, so, like, when my daughter goes, on God, I'm like, I totally understand how we got to that phrasing, but the spit and cap. I am Gen X, so spit and cap means something very different. Wow. If you were raised in the NWA, uh, Dr. Dre like era that I was well, yes. of the nineties, it means but, something a little different. But remember, we also had the word very briefly. Thank God, fleek. Which I don't know where that came from. That's another one that I never understood and no one was ever ever able to explain the etymology of that to me. Although I will say it is very fascinating for anybody who has children to listen to Gen Z talk because they're this close to their own version of Cockney. That's true. Where it's oh like a God. whole secret language that they speak to understand so that other people can't. 
is it's actually like from an etymological standpoint it's kind of fascinating yeah but i do hate it when my daughter says things like oh spitting cap explain yeah because like my uh my eldest with he's with his friends i hear them say stuff i'm like what what the hell like i don't think i don't think my link my slang was that weird for my parents to follow but maybe it was i don't know like i i feel like a lot of the stuff that we said was either like made up like i think about the 80s and people being like oh bodacious okay the valley girl talk yeah like oh my god um things are totally tubular oh my god exactly gag me with a Uh, spoon gag me with a spoon or if you watch heather's my favorite thing of all times (laughs) fuck me with a chainsaw gently (laughs) heather's is an underrated masterpiece but also kind of weird too Anyways, our next book is Katie and Blood, and I'm going to drink my cup of blood while we talk about Katie and Blood next time. Actually, probably not. I just needed blood for this one, for obvious reasons. Because, as Skywatcher Adapt- Adept has informed me, it was used, like, 500 times. I want to see his word count for blood and devastation a ball. Get on that, sir. For posterity. Also, I want to see the receipts on the fact that Wrath was not as well used as Rage. I mean, Wrath um, was at least 300 times. I'm... It had to have been. It felt like it at any rate. I swear oh to God, God, there was one sentence that was used like five times. It had to have been. I, I think I know the exact sentence, too, because I got to it and I was like, ah, that's why Carrie's triggered. Do you want to take us out, Carrie? I guess. I mean, Yeah get done with all of this fun so you've listened to the warhammer 40k book club book club wow i am done episode regarding wrath of the lost by chris forrester so be sure to join us next time for katie and blood another blood book excitement all the blood all the blood by aaron dimsky bowden we are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the black library or any of its affiliates you can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website wh40kbookclub.com if you like this episode please like subscribe give a review and all those things to the vidcast on youtube or the podcast anywhere you get podcasts our site also has articles about our adventures and reading other warhammer 40k books and short stories outside of the book club books, so please stay a while and read from a crag. Yeah, this is why we don't drink that often on the show anymore. To do a wellness check on me tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah, do a wellness check on both of us. If the podcast is, like, not on time on Friday, you know why. Here we go. Cheers. <laughs>